Well, if you'll turn with me to First Peter, First Peter, I'm just loving this epistle so much, and we just can't even get out of verse two. And I'm just gonna, we're going to get in again, and we're going to look at it again next week. Uh, Peter is the example of God's ministry to restore and equip saints for the commission, fallen saints who blew it really bad. He doesn't disregard us and throw us aside because of sin or weakness or fallenness. He works to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. That is the promise that God has made and I will finish it. And his favorite instrument is affliction and trial and brokenness. That is how God gets the clay pliable. And that is when he works the deepest and the most profound uh, in my own life and every life I've ever shepherded. That is the place God brings us to. Peter, now he's writing to the church to encourage it in the midst of a growing persecution that's coming upon the church and it will climax in Nero bringing a storm upon the church by killing and torturing many believers. And so Peter is getting us ready for how we're to live in a hostile world to everything that we are, everything that we believe in, and everything that we hope for. The world is hostile to it. And so he begins his letter by first reminding them that they're aliens. You don't belong here. You're passing through. You're sojourning. Don't get comfortable. Don't put your tent stakes down and think this is it. Keep fighting. Your true home is heaven. Your true home is when God will come and consummate all things. Don't lose your focus. Don't get set on this world that's passing away. And even more so, he tells us that we are chosen aliens. We're not just uh, separate and sojourners, that we're God's choice. He, he set his love upon us. The, the world may reject you, it may persecute you, but the God of the universe has set his love upon you. Let that have its effect upon your mind and your hearts. You are chosen aliens. And so while we live in the day of a disregard, I believe, for doctrinal precision and truth, we're told that doctrine divides We have run from truths then that are plainly laid out in Scripture that are to gird us up in our living and in the midst of a very hostile world. And Peter is not ashamed of the doctrine of election. He sees it as the most foundational truth in our need for suffering. It's the very first point that he lays out and he's going to modify the whole thing in verse 2, that you need this for suffering. It's the first thing that he tells the churches. You are chosen people. This can't be hidden. It can't be ignored for the sake of a so-called unity. It needs to be understood. It needs to be cherished. It needs to be believed and thus used as a foundation stone for us to stand on in the days that are fast coming upon us. You need to get this understood in your heart, live upon it, and wired because the days of persecution are increasing and will increase. Peter did not see this as a doctrine that was unnecessary and one that we do not need to think about. So what does Peter mean then that we are chosen, that we are the elect of God? I wrote this definition about 25 years ago, and I was reading different books, and I can't even remember who they all are. So if you are new to this doctrine or even new to the faith, probably everything I'm about to read isn't going to make a lot of sense. Uh, If you are, take it in and treasure it. It, There's just gorgeous truths (laughs) And this statement, <clears throat> by the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life, and others are not. These angels and men thus predestinated and foreordained are particularly and unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or or diminish. The names are written in the Lamb's book of life. As God has appointed the elect unto glory, that we would be glorified unto him one day, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will. Uh, Sovereign election is the freeness of God to choose and do as he pleases. He foreordained then all the means thereunto. So he chose them, and he chose the means of how he will bring about bringing us to glory. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, when Adam sinned, we all went with them, are going to be redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith 
in Christ by his spirit working in due season, which will be our focus this morning, they are justified. They come to faith and they believe and they're saved and the righteousness of God is put to their account and he declares you just, just before God. Then you are adopted into the family of God. You're sanctified. You're set apart for God and he will grow you into his image and you are kept by his power through faith unto salvation as we'll see in the weeks ahead in Peter. So neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, or sanctified and saved, but the elect only. So foundational to a proper understanding of the doctrine of unconditional election is the biblical definition then of the term election, the Greek word ek loge, and it is always used of picking or selecting out of a group of humanity. Thus, it indicates the making of a specific and distinct choice from among many. And so Peter's just telling you, among all of the mass of humanity, God reached in and he, he chose you for this glorious redemption that we are going to be studying in the weeks ahead in Peter. And so we come to Scripture and we see the whole storyline is God choosing whom he will for his story. He casts the parts. He says to Israel, of all the nations, you only have I chosen. Uh, Israel never struggled with election because they were the elect nation from all the nations. They knew it. They boasted in it. Uh, they, they had gratitude in it. Abraham in Nehemiah 9, 7, thou art the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeas and gave him the name Abraham. You chose him, God. Genesis 21, 12, God said to Abraham, <coughs> excuse me. Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. He says, through Isaac I've chosen him, and through him the blessing will come to the people of God. In Romans 9, he said, I chose Jacob. Esau and Jacob, I loved him before he was even born or done anything good or bad. I chose him for my purpose. In Isaiah 42, 1, Jesus said, uh, behold, my servant who I, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the nations. God has chosen Jesus for his purpose. In John 15, 16, the apostle says, you did, Jesus said this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. In Genesis, uh, Galatians 1.15, but when he, Paul says, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased. He called Paul and set him apart even in his mother's womb for the purpose that he would have for Paul. Ephesians 1.4, he chose the church just as he chose us, the church, in him, Christ, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us to the adoption as sons. In Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, remember the former things long past, for I'm God and there's no other. I am God and there's no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. I am God and I have a plan. I do as I please and I will bring it to pass. What should this do for us? If we would bow to this doctrine and see that God does as he pleases and only as he pleases, he is God. That before the foundation of the world, Christian, he chose you to be in his number. And it'll number that he says will be as great as the sand on the seashore. Well, why would he do this? Why would he do this? And come back then to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. He writes to those who are chosen and in verse 2, we have three phrases now that modify the word chosen. And so we are now going to enter into this Trinitarian view of, of God and the gospel and what he does. There are three different persons who act as one and how they will work out salvation for the glory of God alone. They are in perfect unity, perfect harmony, and how they will bring about this salvation. So on Mother's Day, and I'm still sorry about that, mothers, we looked at the foreknowledge of God, and, and I just want to tell you how many mothers came up to me and thanked me, okay? So the ones of you who were mad at me, there were some who are really happy about studying foreknowledge on Mother's Day. So 
Next year, we'll do something fun like that again. <clears throat> Double predestination next Mother's Day. <clears throat> so, we worked hard with this word, then he says in verse 2, he chose us according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and we studied that word and looked at it from Old Testament to New Testament. What did it mean? And it was tied to the setting of an affection upon and a choosing to bring into covenant blessing. And so it's to set your, your love and your favor upon an object. And so God chose and he, he, he set his love upon you before the foundation of the world. That's an overwhelming truth to realize I've been loved eternally by God. It's so essential then to what Peter is saying. You might not be the choice of the world, but God did choose you. I, I want you to get that. That's how you're going to endure suffering. This world isn't going to choose you. It's never going to approve you and love you if you will really live. Uh, in Matthew 5, if you live a beatitude attitude, you will be persecuted. He promises it. You'll be spit out. But God has favor upon you. He chose you. He loves you. He delights over you. He chose you because before the foundation of the world, he set his love upon you and decreed to bring blessing upon blessing to you for all of eternity. It will never end. It's just going to be wave after wave of grace for all of eternity, favor and love, safety and a security forever. What would this do to our identities and our self-image if we could understand this? What would this do for people who have been rejected all of your days and ridiculed by this world? What would it do for people trying to prove to the world that you're something really special? It could just set you free. What would it do uh, to be an alien who's hated and persecuted by the world? According to Peter, it will cause you to go into a furnace and come out as refined gold, radiating more of the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ if you could lay hold of this. That, that is really all I need. Thank you, Peter. Ready, break. I'm loved by God for the foundation of the world. I can endure anything. I got what I need. If this whole world hates me and spits me out, the only one that really matters loves me. I'm ready. Go suffer. But he has two more phrases to modify our election so you can't leave. It says that he chose us not just setting of his love upon us, he goes all the way to accomplish his ultimate purpose, which is to glorify himself and to give his son a bride on the very last day, all perfect and spotless and blameless from all the elect, from all the ages, all the glory going to the Godhead forever and ever and ever, and he will be worshiped. And so here's our next question then. How does this eternal love and a choosing that happened in eternity past, how does it come into this world? How does it come to me? How do I get this? I'm, I'm glad God has loved me in this way. I'm really glad that he chose me. But now you've got this huge mass of unredeemed humanity. And just every day it's hating God. It loves itself. It wants to be God and tell him how to be God. It's trying to satisfy your five senses at any cost. It's trying to merit and earn the favor of God. And so the question is, what do you do with a big mass of humanity that is alienated and at enmity with God and hates Him? Well, God has to now take His chosen ones then out of this realm that I just described, this mass of humanity, of lostness. He's got to do something. He needs to take them out of the realm of sin and death. The wrath of God is upon you, Jesus said in John 3. He's got to fix that. He has to uh, bring us out and make us separate. They need a bunch of things fixed and changed if you're ever going to be the people of God. So you need the wrath of God removed because you can't be good enough to get it off you. And so you need it poured out on the Son of God hanging on a cross for your sin. You need the law fulfilled. You must have perfect righteousness to be in his presence. It must be fulfilled so Jesus Christ comes and fulfills every jot and tittle. You need a new heart. So I will take that stony heart, I'll rip it out, and I'll give you a new heart of flesh now that loves me and loves my law, loves my truth to obey it. I'm going to give you a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. I will put within you, I will give him to you, 
and I will adopt you and I will give you the word. I will give you the church of God to work this out. There's a bunch of things that need to be done to get these people out of this mass of lost humanity. So God sends his son into the world to take care of the eternal problem of how guilty, defiled sinners by their very nature can dwell in the presence of a holy, righteous God. How how can that ever come about? How can you get rid of your sin? How can you do this, God, forgive us and still be just? And in the wisdom of God, to make it simple, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there is no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. This Bible shows how he is from cover to cover. He dies on a cross in the place of sinners. God raises them from the dead and declares that it's, it's finished, it's sufficient, it's enough. He is the answer. He accomplished redemption. There's salvation in no other name. Jesus is, I love it, it means he saves. He's able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through him. He's a savior. He's a savior of sinners, and he is able to save. Well done, Jesus Christ. But now what Jesus did, it has to be applied, okay? 2,000 years ago, that's what he did, but I need it applied today. So when God chose us, he also chose the means and the time and how he would apply it to you personally. So every testimony should be, this is how God brought me to Jesus Christ. Every testimony should declare, this, listen to what God did. Here is how he drew me to himself, and I give him all the glory. God has brought me to Jesus Christ. Every, everyone is different and beautiful. I never tire of testimonies because I love how different God does it in every heart and every soul. I wish we could just take a, a month and everybody share their testimony just back to back to back to back and just everyone marvel and say, God is amazing the variety of how he saves sinners and brings them into it. I just, I, I don't like testimonies of how you brought yourself to Jesus Christ. It just rings hollow in my ears. Could you imagine Lazarus going around telling everybody how he brought himself back to life? I just got up and walked right out. Corpses don't give testimonies of what they did, except I'm lying there dead as a doornail. Corpses just give glory to God who has shown in their hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let there be light. Boom, there was. Ephesians 2 But God, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were spiritual corpses. What changed it? You? No. But God, the testimony of every life. God, who's rich in mercy, who should have left you dead in your sins, but he's rich in mercy, so he didn't. So because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Positionally, this very morning, you are seated with Jesus Christ in victory in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves. It's a gift from God. So how does God take his eternal decrees, his sweet election of his eternal love for his people, and then how does he bring it into time and space? So in time and space, his son came into the world and he accomplished salvation. But now in every life, there needs to be us being brought to this promise of salvation and being joined to Jesus Christ. So if you'll look with me in 1 Peter verse 2. Last time we were together in Peter We were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. This morning, I want you to see the second modifying phrase to the chosen. You're chosen by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And so, again, this is how it goes from a plan to reality. The way it comes, then, is by the Spirit. The only way that you will go from death to life, that this will ever come to you, is by the Holy Spirit of God. 
This is how the eternal decree, which was not known in time and space, but it's as the Spirit brings you to salvation. How do I know if I'm one of God's elect? Because of the sanctifying work of the Spirit. If he has brought me to life and given me faith and repentance, I have been chosen before the foundation of the world. So you see that you were elect before he created anything, and you, you, you might be saved for 30 years now since you believed upon Jesus Christ. There was a point in time. And so election becomes reality in the sphere of the work of the Holy Spirit who draws you to Jesus Christ. So there are ways this word sanctified can be used. We've been studying it in Sunday school. There's your initial sanctification. And that means when you're saved, you're taken out and you are set apart for God. And then there's what's called progressive sanctification. And that's now you're going to start growing in holiness. And then there's your ultimate sanctification on that last day when your position and practice are going to meet. You're going to be made perfect in the presence of God. So all three of those terms can be used in talking about sanctification. So the question is, which one is Paul talking about here? And so every conservative scholar I read, and I think because of the context, saw it as that initial being set apart from death and sin to life in Christ. It, it's, it's now setting the stage for progressive and ultimate sanctification, but this is that initial God setting you apart. And so this is referring to what we call the new birth. When Jesus said, unless you're born again, you want to in the kingdom of heaven, unless by the sanctifying work of the Spirit you are set apart and made alive, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And so regeneration is the term. It means to be born again. It means to be made new. It means to be dead and now to be made alive spiritually. So we were still born uh, spiritually, and now God brings us to life spiritually by his Holy Spirit. The Greek word hagiosmos, it means separate to set apart or consecrated. You are now set apart to God. That mass of humanity that we lived in, where we lived according to self as a center reference point in all of our lostness, the Spirit now pulls you out of that, and you are, are aliens still in this world, but now you have a whole new nature, a whole new heart, all new desires, and the Spirit of God has done that in your heart. So the Holy Spirit began working in our lives in time and space to draw us to see Jesus Christ as the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in a field that we would give up anything that I might have Christ. If you see Christ that way this morning, the only explanation is the Holy Spirit of God has done that in your heart, and you should worship Him and give glory to Him. Realizing that this world, it, so he, he starts drawing you, and, and you start realizing, you know what, this world can't bring true happiness. I I'm like a dog chasing my tail. Whatever I go after, it never, I like Solomon. It's like chasing after the wind. This will make me happy. No, it didn't. You know, so you start, God, the Spirit starts showing you that. Uh, death is pressed upon you where Luther got hit by lightning and all he could think about was death now and judgment. And it began to consume a man who once could live free. And now in his lost state, I can't quit thinking about death. Now there begins to be maybe a guilt and a shame before God with who I am and who God is. And there's fear that begins to come in. And suddenly now you begin to see the predicament that there is a God and I'm not right with him and I can't fix it. I've tried religion, I've tried positive thinking, I've tried everything I possibly could, and nothing can fix this problem. I'm a sinner by nature. I can't clean myself up. Nothing is working. And then you see Jesus Christ as the perfect remedy for your situation. I pray that every soul in here has come to that place. If you're still in that place of realizing it and you still can't find it, the remedy is in Jesus Christ. Look to me, you now believe that that is God's remedy and it is sufficient and I'm looking to that alone as my only hope to be made right with God. That's what the Spirit of God does. You repent and you believe. You, 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 you've been thinking all wrongly and living all wrongly and I repent for how I live as, as if I was God and He wasn't and now I turn by faith and I look to Christ and to Christ alone. That is all the work of the Holy Spirit. Because you were chosen before the foundation of the world, God set his love on you. The Spirit came and he did that work different but specific in every one of the lives that sit here. So who gets all the glory for what we just went over? Amen. He gets all the glory. 
That is why this happened. That is why you're not happy and drinking up world, the world to the full. That's why you're trying to morally clean up yourself because you need the gift of God. And in time and space, the Spirit brought you to this place and you believed. And the eternal election and love brought you to the place of belief. But all you knew at that point is that you believed in Jesus. Someone came and preached him or shared him with you and you believe that's all you knew about it. It's just like your physical birth. When you're born, do any of you remember it very well? I don't. And so what you do then is you go back and you read books on obstetrics and, and you start seeing how you were formed and shaped in the womb. I never could care about, less about that in biology, but when you have your own baby and your wife's pregnant, you get real excited about those things and you start reading and going, that's amazing, this is happening, this is forming, and you learn all these things about how you were birthed and brought into this world. So it is with your new birth spiritually. All you know is that you love Jesus Christ. I believe in him. I was lost, but now I'm found. That's all I know. And then you go back to obstetric books like 1 Peter and Romans 9, and you learn how God is the one who birthed you. God is the one who brought you into this world. God granted you the gift of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, and now you marvel and glory at how you were brought to birth spiritually. We learn that before the foundation of the world, God set his love and choice of you. He predestined that you would be brought to him at the exact time in the exact way that it happened. And you just worship. And you marvel at such amazing, infinite love. Amen? I, I should blow you away this morning if any of you love Jesus Christ. I loved myself so much I would have died happily and been destroyed for all of eternity. And God invaded me. He invaded me and he did something to my heart that I could have never done on my own. And now there is but one focus. Christ. I want you just, will you just listen to the scriptures? Because who cares what Pastor Murphy thinks? It means very little. Okay? I want you to hear what God says. Just sit and listen to a few verses on this. In Acts 15, 7. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by the mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe, where they're arguing about Jew and Gentiles coming in, and he's saying, God made a choice among you. <clears throat> Titus 3, 5. He saved us, God. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about this morning. The regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit is how he saved you. 1 Thessalonians 1, we were in that this morning in Sunday school. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. How do I know that he chose me? Because when the gospel came to you, it didn't come in just words only where you just were listening to words. He says it came in the power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you. So you were chosen, and the reason you know is when you heard the word of God, it wasn't just words. It came in the full power of conviction, and, and, and I saw it, and I believed, and I saw the glory of Christ. It acted upon me. I love Paul said it laid hold of me. It grasped me when it came in power. There's a big difference between just hearing words and words on a page and dead versus the soul that's been born again by the Spirit of God, and these words are life themselves. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. He saved you by the sanctification of the Spirit, being set apart, and the faith and the truth. The Spirit has produced faith in the truth of the gospel that we have believed. 1 Corinthians 6.11, I love it. He lists the, these sins that were characterized in the Corinthians, and he's saying, that isn't you guys. Such were some of you. You were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. The Spirit of God sanctified you. He took you he set you apart. He consecrated you to God. He changed your heart, your motives, your desires, 
That is the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And the main verb there, the way it works, is you're born of God with this participle of the one who's believing. So the one who's been born of God is the one who's believing. If God has brought you to life, if the Spirit has opened your eyes and regenerated you, you're a believing one in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is God who has done that work. The critical work of the Holy Spirit of converting. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.25. Paul's preaching about the, the minister. He says that with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, that God might give you the gift of repentance. You don't, there's this one verse I forget in the Old Testament. It says, turn me that I might turn. Cause me to repent. Turn me around so I can turn around. God, let me repent because you turned me to repent. It's a gift from God. The Holy Spirit even gives you the gift of repentance. This is a great one, Acts 16, 14. A certain woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, she was listening as they're preaching the word, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. The, the reason she responded is God opened her heart to respond to the word of God, and that is what he does in every believer's life. Acts 2.38, Peter said to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's the gospel. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. Acts 26, 18, the gospel has come to open their eyes. The Spirit opens their eyes that they might turn from darkness, repentance, and, and from the dominion of Satan and God in order that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me, set apart by the Spirit by faith in me. And one more, uh, 2 Timothy 1.8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I'm guessing that's a wrong verse. But if it was the right one, you would have loved it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, he opens, he opens your eyes. I, I cannot see spiritual things. He, he says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. I cannot see it. And then God comes and he, he opens your eyes and you realize it's like an octopus. You've got your tentacles and the things of the world that are going to perish and destroy and you realize, I'm going to die. This is going to damn me and condemn me. And I let go and I turn from it in repentance and I put these tentacles in the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you alone can save. You are my God, my Lord, my Savior. I put my faith in you and in you alone. So we are then set apart for God we are his by the Holy Spirit. Oh my. Two more verses and we'll go to the table. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. One of the most truest statements ever. Whoever will receive Christ, whoever will believe, will become children of God. And the question is, who can receive him? Who can believe? And in the next verse, he actually tells us who that is. Those who are born not of blood, not by Jewishness, nor of the will of the flesh, our boasted free will, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those who are born of God will receive and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And in John 3, I truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said, unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You will never be able to see it unless God gives you spiritual eyes to see. You are completely dependent upon the grace of Almighty God. And so you knew I would quote Spurgeon before I was done. I want you to listen to Spurgeon. Before salvation came into this world, election marched in the very forefront. And it had for its word the, the billeting of salvation. He says, election went through the world and it, it marked the houses in which salvation should come. There's that choosing. 
and the hearts in which the treasure should be deposited. Election looked through all the race of man from Adam down to the last, and it marked with a secret stamp those to whom election was designed. He must needs go through the earth, said election, and salvation must go there. <clears throat> then came predestination. Predestination did not merely mark the house, it mapped the road for which salvation must travel to that house. Predestination ordained every step of the great army of salvation. Predestination ordained the way in which the sinner would be brought to Christ, the manner in which he should be saved, the means that would be employed. It marked the exact hour and moment when God the Spirit should quicken the dead in sin and peace and pardon should be spoken by the blood of Jesus Christ to that soul. Predestination marked the way so completely to the house that salvation does never overstep the bounds and is never at a loss for the road. And the everlasting decree of the sovereign God, the footsteps of mercy, were every one of them ordained by God. I pray that you would marvel this morning at the deep, deep love of Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at what the Spirit has done in our hearts. He caused us this morning to not come to the communion table with just a dead external ordinance. He's caused it where you won't just come and this will be a ritual. There'll, there'll be thousands, maybe millions today who will partake of the Lord's table as just a ritual. But rather now, we have eyes to see. And we can look at the glory of the table now because we see the glory of Jesus Christ and what these will represent in our hearts are invaluable, are invaluable. We see what extent God went to to bring his eternal decree to save us. And the extent that God went is the cross of Jesus Christ. To, to bring about this election that he, he chose us, it took that his son had to come and secure it. And so what we are going to remember now with the eyes of faith is what Jesus Christ did so that I could be in the numbers, so that I could be saved and redeemed and brought in the family of God and be eternally secure for all of eternity. We, we can't glory in Jesus Christ enough. I can't uh, use hyperbole when I describe the beauties and the excellencies of Christ. And so now, because the Spirit has opened up our eyes, we have the ability to come together now and remember in a way that it, it does. It affects our hearts and our lives and our minds of what Jesus Christ did to redeem me and bring me to the Father. The cost of His own Son, the Son giving up His own life in our place as a substitute. We have eyes to see We've been given the, the, the gift of faith, and this is our blessed hope. And so I pray that we'll now look our eyes out as we remember Jesus Christ. Jesus you know, held up that cup and the bread, and he said, do this in remembrance of me, uh, that now we, we will do this in remembrance of what God has done to secure salvation. And now me, by the Spirit, who has caused my heart to believe and love him, I can have a great blessing and treasure of what we're about to do corporately. And, and I'm really big on how this unifies the body. Is, uh, I was enjoying the worship. I looked up there and there were four different cultures represented in the people leading worship. And it's like you can't find this anywhere. But in the body of Christ, there's such a unity and a oneness uh, that we have in Jesus Christ. And so now we're going to be reminded that I, I love every person in this room because we have this one faith, one Lord, and one baptism, and communion is a sweet time to remember that, and that it was given in Corinthians when they were forgetting one another, and some weren't even getting food, and they were just, there was just kind of an abuse of the Lord's table. And so it's really a time where I, I remember the beauty of the gospel and the, the oneness that we have in it. And even if I need to ask forgiveness, if there's someone I've been, I've been holding a grudge, sinning against, uh, not forbearing, and all these different things. It's a good time to check really your soul and your heart. Where, where am I at? Uh, am I manifesting the beauty of what I'm about to remember? Uh, I'm sitting here remembering Jesus, why I won't forgive my sister. I won't forgive my wife. You know, it just, it doesn't work. And so this is really a, a time why the elements are 
passing out than to set our minds on the beauty and the glory of what, that God opened my eyes to see this as a value and a treasure is so sweet. Just let's remember that now and then let, let's act in accord with the beauty and the unity and the oneness that we share uh, in this beautiful thing. So let's um, have a time of, I think there's going to be a, some music played and just the elements will be passed out. And as the elements are passed out, I, I like to remind you it's an ordinance for believers then is what we just learned is to do this as an external observance. It won't help you at all. But the, the value is for the one who has eyes to see. And it, it's a great encouragement to the faith to look upon Christ with the eye of faith. So uh, if you're an unbeliever, we encourage you not to partake, but to come talk to us afterwards. Uh, how can I be a believer in Jesus Christ? How can I find this salvation that you're talking about? So we encourage you in that. And let's enter now uh, into a time of examination. I'm going to close in prayer, and then the guys will come pass out the elements. Father, I thank you for the beauty of 1 Peter 1, 2. I thank you that uh, Peter knew that what the suffering church needed was to know they were chosen. They needed to, to realize they're, they're aliens, they're separate in this world, but they're, they're chosen by God. If we ever had to pick, who would I want to be accepted by, my neighbor or by Jesus Christ? Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you that we are your choice. You chose us. You set your love upon us. And I thank you, Lord, that that love was never based on my merit or my worth. So my, my unworthiness and my unmerit will never cause your love to deviate. God, it's a love that will not let me go. It's a love that will sanctify me. It's a love that will bring me to glory, guaranteed. And I pray now that every heart is overwhelmed with this love I thank you that it was according to your foreknowledge and it was by the Spirit who set us apart, the Spirit who has now taken us out of this dominion of darkness into the kingdom of light, the Spirit who has opened our eyes to see the loveliness of Jesus Christ, the perfect remedy that he is for our situation. And so, God, we thank you that you are the one who opened our eyes to see this. And with our free will, Lord, we did freely choose Christ. It was the freest choice we've ever made. But we thank you that you're the one who made us willing. You're the one who opened our eyes. And, and we thank you then that uh, we have this beautiful choice to follow the Lord Jesus Christ all of our days. And so we rejoice in the beauty and the glory. And we just want to thank you. As we remember now, may our hearts be full of gratitude that we see. God, let us worship you now at the table together. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.